Hello everyone. For tonight, we are going to continue our exhaustive review of chemical elements. In part 1, we ended with the element number 12 in the periodic table, magnesium. And our next element is aluminium, which is number 13. As you remember from part 1, this means that it has 13 protons in its nucleus. So make yourself comfortable. Maybe grab a cup or a glass of something you like to drink. Or you can close your eyes if you wish to fall asleep. And don't hesitate to let yourself go whenever you feel like it. So, let's begin with our first element tonight, element number 13, aluminium. We are all rather familiar with aluminium because it is quite present in our daily lives, in plenty of appliances, in cars, in metal cans for drinks. And you may have noticed that it is also very lightweight for a metal. It is not very dense and we will see why. In the previous story, I told you about families or groups of elements that are presented vertically in the periodic table of elements. And the elements within these groups share some of their properties. When it comes to their propensity to associate with other elements, to form molecules and compounds, these properties are strongly determined by their number of electrons. When they associate with others, atoms try to fill, to saturate their outermost layer of electrons. And this makes them strongly inclined to look for the few ones they miss, or to give away one or two. And it makes them prone to react more or less with other elements. Elements of the same group, of the same family, have the same number of electrons to give away or to find. And this is why they share some of their properties with others from the same family. Aluminium is in the family of boron that I told you about already. And this boron family forms compounds primarily with oxygen. It bounds very easily with it. This is the reason why, on Earth, aluminium is almost never found in nature as a free element. It almost always comes as an oxide in association with oxygen. So there's a lot of aluminium in the Earth's crust. It is even the third most abandoned element there, after oxygen and silicon. But it almost always comes associated, not alone. In particular, in a type of rock called bauxite. Bauxite is a kind of sedimentary rock that is often reddish brown, but it can also be white. And the composition of this rock can vary, but it is rich in aluminium. It contains different types of aluminium oxides. Typically, the way to extract metals is to mine ore for example, uh, iron or copper or or being a general term for compounds that are rich in one or several metals. Because in nature, metals are almost never found pure and uh, alone, separated from other elements. For most common metals, this ore is smelted inside a furnace immediately after extraction, if it is rich enough, 
or, if it isn't, after a first treatment. And along this processing, unwanted elements are eliminated like this. They are separated from the metal that comes out pure, or almost pure, from the whole process. In the case of aluminium, things are a bit different. The ore is bauxite, and it is not smelted, but rather treated chemically and electrically. First, aluminium oxides are extracted because bauxite contains other elements that are unwanted. This gives alumina, which is pure aluminium oxide. And this alumina is treated electrically. It consists of aluminium plus oxygen. So the goal is to separate these two elements and collect only pure aluminium. This is achieved with uh, electrolysis, the separation of elements using an electric current between two electrodes. In the case of aluminium electrolysis, one electrode is made of carbon that serves as an alternative pairing to oxygen atoms. After they separate from aluminium, they bond with carbon to make carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. This gets rid of oxygen, and pure aluminium can be harvested, collected this way. Aluminium has different things, different aspects that make it appealing. It is relatively easy to work with, the abundance of bauxite makes it accessible. It is not a rare element. I told you before that it is the third most abundant in the Earth's crust. And it is also lightweight for such a strong material. So, aluminium has appeal, and indeed it has many uses. But it can be relatively expensive to produce because it requires a lot of electricity. Really a lot. An aluminium plant can consume as much electricity as a small city. And this is why, traditionally, since this production process was discovered and industrialized in the 19th century, aluminium plants have been built near cheap electricity sources, like dams, that produce hydroelectric power. And uh, the production of aluminium also has a significant environmental cost because of the uh, energy required first and also because of the release of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. But still, aluminium is very useful when uh, strength and uh, lightness are required. For example, to make aircraft. Since the rise of modern aviation, planes have been using a lot of aluminium parts. It is also used for packaging. For example, to can beer or sodas. But why is aluminium so light in comparison with other metals like iron? There is not one, but rather two reasons to it. The molecular mass and how atoms are arranged. So, first, the molecular mass. A nucleus of aluminium always has 13 protons. And the most common isotope of aluminium has 14 neutrons. So that makes 27 particles in the nucleus. Iron typically has 56 particles in its nucleus. So it has twice the mass of aluminium for one atom. And on top of that, 
The way aluminium atoms are arranged at atmospheric conditions on Earth leaves more void between them, more space. So it takes one and a half times more iron atoms to uh, fill the same volume. And between the lower molecular mass and less atoms, these are the reasons why aluminium objects like aluminium ladders or cans feel so lightweight in comparison with iron or steel. They require less atoms, and on top of that, these atoms have half the mass. In total, the density of aluminium is about one-third of the density of iron. Our next element is another one that is very present in our daily lives. It is silicon, number 14. I told you before that silicon was the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust, after oxygen. Silicon alone represents 28% of the mass of the Earth's crust. And in association with oxygen, it forms compounds that are called silicates which are also commonly called rocks. These minerals, silicates, represent 90% of the Earth's crust. And under the same forms associated with oxygen, silicon is widely distributed in the universe, in cosmic dust, asteroids, and rocky planets or satellites. It is the eighth most abundant element in the universe. And I told you that silicon was extremely present in our lives, and this from prehistoric times. Many building materials or materials for crafts contain some clays, sand, stone. Since it is a major component of sand and rock, it also ends up in cement, in concrete, so we find it in our houses or our roads. Glass is also made primarily from silicon. There are different possible compositions for glasses, because glass is the name given to a type of solid that is often transparent and chemically amorphous. Amorphous in chemistry. This means that if you look at it, even at a microscopic scale, the atoms it is made of are not ordered, they are not arranged following a pattern, but instead they form a pile arranged randomly. Hence the term amorphous that suggests that there is no shape, no pattern to it. So in chemistry, an amorphous solid is the opposite to a crystal. A crystalline structure is one where there is a periodic arrangement of atoms that repeats itself. The exact opposite to an amorphous structure. That can be a bit confusing because in everyday language, glass and crystal are sometimes considered almost the same thing, and they can look the same, but if we look more closely at their structure, they are very different. Yet another frequent use of silicon is in uh, silicones, which are very large molecules, and there are different sorts of silicones with different properties. But what they have in common is that they contain a lot of silicon atoms, together with other elements we already reviewed, like oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Silicones are used in a lot of things, in uh, sealants, in lubricants, adhesives, for insulation, in cookware. Yet another critical use of silicon is in electronics. 
highly purified elemental silicon is essential to making the transistors and uh, chips that are used in electronic devices. So uh, computers, smartphones, all the uh, onboard electronics in cars, in uh, home appliances, all of this could not function without silicon. The property of silicon used in these uh, applications is that it is a semiconductor, which, as the name says, means that it can conduct electricity, but not always or not perfectly. A semiconductor falls somewhere between uh, an insulator, for example glass, we just talked about it, and a conductor, such as a uh, iron or copper. Silicon is also an important element in biology. Not that much for large animals, only traces are present in our organisms. But it is uh, present and necessary in small quantities in many plant tissues. And there are also different microorganisms, microscopic algae and animals, that use it to build a kind of tiny skeleton for themselves. Element number 15 is phosphorus, yet another critical element to life. When I told you of nitrogen in the previous part, I explained that nitrates were important for plant growth and used in fertilizers so are phosphates, that are different compounds that contain phosphorus. Phosphorus is not a very rare element. In 1 kg of earth crust, there is about 1 gram, 1 thousandth of phosphorus. But it is very reactive in normal conditions. And this is why it is never found as a, a pure element on Earth, a free element. Pure phosphorus at normal conditions can have different forms, different allotropes. You remember that an allotrope is a, a different arrangement of the same atom that can give the element a different appearance and properties. For example, graphite also known as pencil lead, is chemically identical to a diamond. Both are pure carbon, but the atoms are arranged differently. And here, pure elemental phosphorus comes under two major forms, two allotropes, white and red phosphorus. You know the term phosphorescence, which is used for things that glow after illumination. It actually comes from phosphorus, because it was observed that white phosphorus had a, like a faint glow when exposed to oxygen. This glow is produced by oxidation of phosphorus when it has its white form. It doesn't happen with red phosphorus. The correct term to refer to this phenomenon should be chemiluminescence. Nowadays, the term phosphorescence names another process that is independent, unrelated to phosphorus. It's a bit confusing. But this term, phosphorescence, historically appeared because of the glow of white phosphorus. Our next element Number 16 is sulfur. Under normal conditions, sulfur is solid and looks like yellow crystals. A particularity is that sulfur atoms tend to go by 8 in these normal conditions, and they form molecules with 8 atoms. Sulfur was one of the first elements to be identified because it is relatively abundant. 
It was known in ancient times from China to the Mediterranean. Nowadays, a lot of sulfur is obtained from the treatment of oil and natural gas. When they are refined, stripped of their unwanted component, elemental sulfur is a frequent byproduct, trash, of refining. And this covers the needs of the chemical industry that uses sulfur for fertilizers to make matches or insecticides. After the elements that make the basic bricks of organic life, like oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, that are present in large quantities in our bodies, sulfur is another essential element to life. It is present in compounds that make amino acids, proteins, in vitamins, or in keratin, that is the building material of our hair or nails. Many elements are necessary to organic life, actually, apart from very rare and heavy atoms that we will review later. We need dozens of different elements, many of them just as traces. One of the few exceptions among those we have just reviewed, is aluminium. It is not part of the biochemical functioning of any living being that we know of. After sulfur comes chlorine with number 17. Under normal conditions, chlorine is a pale yellow or greenish gas but it is extremely reactive, which is what makes it toxic when it is a gas, but also explains why it is absent from the air. It reacted long ago with oxygen, nitrogen or sodium to form compounds like table salt, which I told you about when we discussed sodium. In antiquity and the medieval period, salts containing chlorine were quite popular with alchemists, because by heating and mixing them, they could make spectacular experiments. For example, they could make a substance called aquaregia, Latin for royal or regal water. Aquaregia was a mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acids. First, it is a fuming liquid, so it makes an impression, but it also has the power to dissolve gold, which gave it an aura of magic. By the way, since we are in the Middle Ages, when were all these different elements we are talking about discovered? The way elements are classified changed a lot in the past two or three centuries. There were many different models that arose from the late 18th century to the 20th century. Prior to that, the nature of matter was the subject of much speculation from the ancient world to the Middle Ages. A common model was the belief that matter was made of a small number of basic elements water, fire, air, earth. In some cultures, they also included metal or wood. This conception was sidelined in modern times, when the first chemical elements were discovered. We know today what water, air or fire are made of. They are not essential basic elements, but instead they are made of different atomic elements. Water is oxygen and hydrogen. Fire, if we just consider the flame, is primarily a mix of carbon dioxide, water vapor, oxygen and nitrogen plus whatever elements the burning object may contain and release. 
air, if we take the air around us, is a lot of nitrogen and oxygen, plus a bit of hydrogen because there is moisture in it, carbon, and traces of plenty of other gases. Earth, as we have seen, is going to vary a lot depending on where you take it, but it contains always about two-thirds of oxygen and silicon, plus plenty of other elements. It can contain a lot of water, too, if it is wet. So, all these primordial elements that were thought to be the basic components, the basic bricks of matter in ancient times, are in reality compounds of other elements. The atomic classification is something that arose from the late 18th century and during the 19th century. The first periodic table of the elements as we know it was from 1913. At the time it had a few dozen elements, way less than today. Today there are 118, because some of them had not been discovered yet. If we look at the timeline of the discovery of elements, out of these 118, only 14 were known in antiquity. These included a lot of metals, iron, obviously, copper, zinc, silver, gold, platinum, tin, lead. We will go through many of these metals later. 27 more elements were discovered from the Renaissance to the Age of Enlightenment, three centuries between the 16th and the 18th centuries. That could be called the time of the scientific revolution. Most of the elements I told you about until this point are among them, with the exception of noble gases like helium or neon, that were discovered in the 19th century, and lithium too. The 19th century was like a golden age for chemistry. It started with 41 elements already known, and 42 more were isolated, identified during this century. It was also the time when the atomic theory replaced older approaches, and the systematic classifications of atoms appeared. This good period for discoveries in chemistry continued in the first half of the 20th century, which is when 14 more elements were named, including plenty of naturally radioactive elements like plutonium or francium. One thing that had changed by the beginning of the 20th century was the approach to searching for new elements, waiting to be discovered. The fact that the number of protons in the nucleus was the factor that made an element what it was, meant that there could only be one element with a given number of proton, one element with one proton, one with two, one with three, and so on. So, as the periodic table was completed, chemists and physicists now looked for the element that had a given number of protons. And sometimes these new elements could be synthesized artificially. Some have been created that do not occur naturally. Among very big atoms with dozens of protons and neutrons that are often unstable, I will elaborate a bit more on these very big giant atoms as we approach the end of the periodic table. But some of them only exist or have existed in labs and it's always interesting to know they are real and that they can exist, but they are not used for anything and cannot be found in nature. They have names most of us never hear of. 
like Hoganesson, Tennessee, or Livermore. And they were synthesized in the past 20 years by making atoms collide in colliders or by bombardments with particles. So let's move on to uh, number 18, argon. Argon is the third noble gas after helium and neon that we already covered. The name argon is derived from Greek and it means lazy or idle, which is not surprising for a noble gas, as the other members of this group, and for the same reasons, it has a very low reactivity. Argon is used for fluorescent lighting, like neon, and also due to its low reactivity, it is used in high temperature industrial processes as a shielding gas or for welding. When temperature rises, a lot of elements become more reactive. They are excited by this available caloric energy around them. So this is when a noble gas comes handy. For example, an argon atmosphere is used in uh, graphite electric furnaces to prevent the graphite from burning, which would happen if it was surrounded with a normal oxygen-rich atmosphere. Number 19 is potassium, the third alkali metal after lithium and sodium. Chemically and visually, Potassium is a lot like sodium. In normal conditions, it is a white metal or silver-like metal that is very soft, it could be cut with a knife, and it is very reactive. It reacts immediately with oxygen in the air. So, as you now understand perfectly, this means it's not going to be found free, pure, in our environment, but rather in minerals or dissolved in seawater. An essential role of potassium in our bodies is for nerve transmission. Nerve transmission needs potassium ions, that is to say potassium atoms stripped of electrons with an electric charge these particular ions can cross nerve cell membranes. And this is why we absolutely need some potassium in our food. Fresh fruit and vegetables provide some. And the name potassium actually reflects how it was traditionally obtained. It comes from potash, which are salts containing potassium that were produced by taking ashes of plants, adding water, heating, and evaporating this solution. Potash had different uses long before the Industrial Revolution. In ancient times, it already served to make soap or glass in ceramic or for bleaching textiles. It is an additive that has been in use for thousands of years. Element number 20 is calcium, another abundant element on Earth that we encounter generally as calcium carbonate, associated with carbon and oxygen. It is found in eggshells, in the shells of gastropods, in pearls, but there are huge deposits of calcium carbonate in geological layers made of the skeletons of ancient sea life forms, especially from plankton. For millions and millions of years, the microscopic skeletons they made using calcium have accumulated at the bottom of the oceans. They have been compressed and in different places, like in Western Europe, these layers, these layers of sediments, have then emerged. 
This is what chalk is made of, calcium carbonate. As you know, calcium is also a vital element for our bodies. It is known to serve for bones. But it goes beyond this role. It is actually the fifth most present element in the human body. And it plays a role in the health of our muscular, digestive and circulatory systems. It serves in the synthesis and the operation of blood cells. We couldn't live without it. Now that we have passed element 20, we're going to start to encounter less ordinary and more mysterious elements. We still have a lot of well-known metals to talk about, from iron to copper or gold, and some of them are rather abundant. But we will also encounter other elements we rarely even hear about, like element 21, called scandium. Scandium is part of a set of 17 elements that are often called rare earth metals or rare earths. Each of them has a few industrial applications, generally very specific, as additives in alloys, for components in electronics or as agents in industrial processes, catalysts. You probably never heard their names, unless you have a job that justifies it. Apart from scandium, which is element 21, these rare earths include number 39, yttrium, number 57, lanthanum, 58, cerium. Actually, all elements from 57 to 71 are part of this group. These different elements are found in association between them and with other elements, other metals. So refining of rare earth deposits are always compulsory to extract them and get them in pure form. Demand for some of these rare earth metals has skyrocketed in recent years due to different applications in electronics, like LED lamps, screens, electric vehicles. And at this point, China is by far the most important supplier in the world. So there is a scramble around the world at the moment to put in production other rare earth mines or sites, because these are strategic resources that could also potentially become very lucrative in the next decades. Element 22 is titanium, a metal that is only found as an oxide in nature, but can be purified, reduced. To produce an element that has a silver color, a relatively low density, it feels lightweight, but high strength and high resistance to corrosion. Strength is what titanium is known for. When it is pure, it is as strong as steel, but less dense. Most of the time it is used in alloys with iron and aluminium, when high performance materials are required for example, for aerospace. It also serves as a catalyst. Titanium is denser than aluminium, about 60% denser, but more than twice as strong. So looking at the ratio of its strength to its weight, it is a great choice as a high-performance material. And in various applications, a more upscale alternative to aluminium. Number 23 is vanadium, another metal that was found out in the 19th century, and also presents this silvery-gray aspect. 
It is mainly used in the production of steel and uh, aluminium alloys. It was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century that a small amount of vanadium added in steel could considerably increase its strength. So, since then, many steel objects that need to be particularly strong, like gears, some uh, bicycle frames, crankshafts in engines, these can be made of steel containing vanadium. Another element often added to steel is element number 24, chromium. You know about stainless steel, also called inox. This type, or this family of alloys, was invented when it was discovered that an amount of chromium, typically 10% or more, could make steel resistant to corrosion. It no longer rusts. Chromium forms a coating, a passive film, that prevents damage to the metal. So chromium is very resistant to corrosion and also a hard metal by itself. Apart from stainless steel, another use is chrome plating, the creation of a, a thin film, a thin layer of chromium on metallic objects. You've seen the shiny parts of motorbikes or some cars. These are chrome-plated because chromium is also very resistant to tarnishing. What we call tarnish on metals is in fact just a thin layer of corrosion that appears on them due to a reaction of oxidation with oxygen in the air. It is not always oxygen, actually. For example, silver tarnishes in contact with air, mainly due to hydrogen sulfide, which is a gas present in traces in the ambient atmosphere. So, chromium does not tarnish, and it can be highly and durably polished thanks to this which is why it is used mainly as a, a mean to protect and embellish other metal parts. Element number 25 is manganese, yet another metal that serves in alloys. It often enters the composition of stainless steel too, because it improves strength and resistance to wear. It looks a lot like our next element, which is a big one, iron, number 26. Iron is a big deal. First, because it is, by mass, the most common element on Earth, just ahead of oxygen. There are more oxygen atoms, but an iron atom is about three times as heavy as massive as an oxygen atom. So, by mass, an estimated 32% of Earth is iron, and oxygen represents 30%, a bit less. Most of it is in Earth's outer and inner core, and the prevalence of iron in the crust is less it is only the fourth element in the crust. It is believed a large part of this iron in the crust arrived in the late stages of Earth formation. Iron is heavier than the other elements that make the bulk of the planet's composition. So, over millions of years, it tended to migrate towards the center of the planet towards its core, which is believed to be very rich in iron. This didn't leave much of it in the outer layers of the planet, the ones that cooled down to form the crust. But during millions of years, 
as the planet had already begun to cool down and form a crust, there was an intense bombardment of meteorites. These uh, meteorites are thought to have brought a substantial quantity of the water that we have on Earth, and also iron that stayed uh, trapped close to the surface, close enough to be uh, accessible today. Iron was, and still is, by far the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. But it was not the first to be uh, discovered and used by men. Probably because it is harder to work with than copper. The first metals used for tools and weapons, or crafts, were copper alloys, like bronze, which is copper plus tin, or brass, which is copper and zinc, hence the name Bronze Age. Bronze is an alloy and not an element, and actually the term bronze is a bit unprecise. It can be used for any alloy that has copper in it, and to a lesser extent tin. But why was copper used long before iron? because extracting usable metal from iron ore requires furnaces that reach at least 1500 degrees Celsius, or 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. This is 500 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than required to smelt copper. That's a huge difference, hundreds of degrees, and this technical barrier to the use of iron is why the Bronze Age lasted for centuries, even thousands of years, before bronze was displaced by iron. By the end of the second millennium BC in Eurasia and later in other parts of the world. The importance of iron since then has never decreased and iron is by far the most common metal in our daily lives, in building materials, almost all appliances, tools, cutlery, cars, under the form of steel in particular, it is everywhere. Iron is also the cheapest of all metals due to its abundance and uh, the size of the uh, iron and steel industry. It costs only a few dollars per kilogram or per pound, which makes it cheaper than many foods by weight. And that's a huge contrast with pre-industrial times, when it was not a very precious material, but it was rare and costly enough for people to really take care of whatever iron objects they had. In the previous story, I told you that the very first elements, apart from hydrogen, helium and lithium, with one to three protons respectively, appeared in stars as products of fusion between hydrogen nuclei. Elements four and five, beryllium and boron, are a bit particular because they don't really form by fusion of nuclei they would not remain stable, but they rather appear by a bombardment of existing nuclei by free protons, and there is relatively few of these two elements for that reason. They are not produced on a large scale. But if we leave them aside, after that, elements 6, which is carbon, to 26, iron, are fused by stars when they approach death. They have exhausted their hydrogen and helium resources, and they fuse heavier atoms in the last years or the last moments of their life, when they are approaching their final burst in a supernova. But all fusions are not exactly the same. I told you about that in more detail in previous stories about nuclear fusion and astrophysics. 
the fusions that give atoms up to 26 protons, up to iron, liberate energy when they happen. They are called exothermic. The energy needed to keep the new atom together is less than the energy needed to keep its predecessors together. In other terms, it needs less binding energy. So when the nuclei fuse, this excess energy is liberated, it is released. But above 26 protons in the nucleus, fusion reactions become endothermic. They need to absorb, to consume energy that is turned into binding energy. So no star could ever live durably on this fusion of these heavier atoms. Their creation, their appearance, happens only in the very last moments of a star's life, when considerable energy is released at once and can be absorbed to fuse these heavy elements. So iron is the last exothermic element from the periodic table when it is created. The general rule is that the heavier, the more particles an atom contains, the rarer it is going to be. And as a broad general rule, it works. As we saw, there is incomparably more hydrogen and helium atoms, the first two elements, than any other in the universe as far as we know. But the decrease in occurrence of the elements with their mass is not perfectly uh, linear, not perfectly regular. I told you before that light elements like lithium or boron were relatively rare despite their small atomic number. This is because of their instability or the way they can be created. The abundance of an element also depends on its binding energy. The quantity of energy it would take to make its nucleus break apart and become atoms of a different element, or an isotope of the same element if it gains or loses neutrons. Iron and its various isotopes have one interesting characteristic here. They have the largest binding energy out of the thousands of different isotopes we know of. Thousands of isotopes, because there are 118 elements, as I told you, and each of them has different isotopes, observed or theoretical. So that makes thousands of possible combinations. Out of all of them, Ion atoms have the largest binding energy, which we could translate by saying that ion nuclei really prefer to stay the way they are. They are not inclined at all to break apart. This is thought to be a big reason behind the abundance of ion in the universe, despite its atomic number of 26. It is not such a light element, but once iron appears, it really doesn't go away easily. Iron nuclei will not get broken easily, nor participate in the fusion reactions of heavier elements. And this means that over time, iron tends to accumulate in the universe. Its share of total matter increases. Number 27 is cobalt, a metal that was discovered in the 18th century. Little trivia about cobalt. The name cobalt came from German cobalt, which means goblin, the little fantasy creatures. But why call it goblin? Because ore containing cobalt seemed rather useless and toxic to the miners. It was poor in known metals that could be exploited, and when smelted, 
It produced fumes that contained arsenic, another element we will talk about later. These fumes were very toxic. But in 1735, these cobalt ores were found to be reductible to a new metal, previously unknown, and it was named after this cobalt word. Cobalt was the first metal discovered since ancient times, in more than 2000 years. Nowadays, cobalt is essentially obtained as a byproduct of the mining of more important metals like copper. But it has several uses in industry, for alloys in particular, and one that is very old, dating from before it was identified as an element. Cobalt in compounds like cobalt silicate or cobalt aluminate gives a deep blue color to paints, to glass or to ceramics. And these cobalt blue pigments have been used since antiquity for paintings or jewelry or glass. In biology, Cobalt is also an important component of vitamin B12, which is essential to all animals for the metabolism of cells and DNA synthesis. Let's continue with element 28, nickel. I told you before that a large part of the iron in the earth crust is thought to have come from meteorites by the end of the Earth formation process, when it was bombarded. The same applies to nickel, and this meteoric nickel is found in the combination with iron. The main use of nickel is in metal alloys to improve their resistance to corrosion, or in plating for the same reason. Nickel is widely used to make coins, for example. One particularity of nickel is that it is one of only four elements to be ferromagnetic at room temperature. The other three are iron, cobalt, and a rare element called gadolinium, one of these rare earth elements we talked about before. Ferromagnetic means that they can be attracted by magnets. We are going to conclude for tonight with element number 29, copper, another major metal and probably the most significant industrially after iron. Copper is a rather soft and malleable metal which has a very high thermal and electrical conductivity at room temperature. So it is the material of choice for all electric cables, or more anecdotically, for cookware, because heat will quickly spread out in a copper pan or pot. It melts at a thousand degrees Celsius, a significantly lower temperature than iron. And another thing that made its use easier by our ancestors during prehistory is that it can sometimes be found in a directly usable metallic form, what is called a native metal, one that is found free and immediately usable as opposed to mixed with other elements in an ore. But the bulk of copper on Earth is in the copper ore, and it was also the first metal to be smelted from ores around 5000 BC, thousands of years before iron. But because of its softness, pure copper is not very useful for tools or weapons. The first metals that were practically used on a large scale were bronze, that is to say, alloys of copper and tin. Copper in the Roman era was mined in particular on the island of Cyprus. 
And this is where the name copper comes from. The metal was later named cuprum in Latin, which turned to copper in English. Nowadays, the big copper-producing regions are in South America, Chile and Peru, the southern part of Africa, China and the US. And it seems that copper still has a bright future ahead of it, because of the transition to ever more electricity, to replace fossil fuels. This requires transmission and should sustain demand for copper, which remains the only affordable and efficient option for regular electric cables. For mammals, like us human beings, copper is found in very small quantities in our bodies. But for some mollusks and crustaceans, it can replace iron in blood cells. Our blood cells, or the blood cells of fish too, use hemoglobin, which is a protein containing iron that facilitates the transport of oxygen in red blood cells. But some invertebrate animals don't have hemoglobin, but hemocyanin instead. These proteins can also bind oxygen temporarily to transport it, but with copper atoms instead of iron. This is why blood is not necessarily red. The blood of octopuses or horseshoe crabs is blue because of hemocyanin. We have covered many of the most familiar elements at this point but we still have almost 80 ones to go. We will continue next time, starting with element number 30, zinc. In the meantime, you can close your eyes and let yourself go. I'll be back soon with a new episode. For now, sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.